The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. As we prepare our hearts and our minds and work on finding a lighter for the Christ candle. <laughs> it's in the, in the sacristy. Be with you all. It is good and right that we are gathered and continuing to gather in this holy place, the sanctuary of our Lord. I would like to say a special welcome to anyone who is visiting, whether you are visiting for the first time, whether you have um, come to visit family or friends or are continuing to discern your place in this family of faith. We are glad you're here. There are no strangers at West Raleigh, just friends that we have not yet met. As always, we remember that we are an expanded family of faith, that we are not just worshiping with those whose faces we can see and names we can know from the friendship register, but that we're also joined on by those worshiping with us via live stream. We're really glad and grateful that you are here, that you're able to be here from east and west and north and south, that you're beginning, that you're able to discern a potential place in this family of faith. Um, we are honored and glad that you are here. There are friendship registers, both in the sanctuary on the inside aisle of each pew, as well as in the drop-down box on YouTube under the bulletin menu. I would invite everyone here or worshiping with us on the live stream to complete that friendship register. Here it goes to the outside aisle and then comes back to the center so that we can begin to know one another by name um, and ultimately by story as God makes us into a new community of faith. Um, there is a lot happening in the hour after worship today, a lot. And I hope that you will um, take advantage of at least one, if not two, of these activities. Immediately following worship, um, Arts Ministry is hosting a reception celebrating um, some of the art that has been in the hospitality gallery and um, in, the, in the spirit gallery just around the corner that has been um, done by some of our youth artists, specifically Martha Nichols and Penelope and Piper Balcom. Um, they have used multimedia for this art, so you will be able to see it in the hospitality ga gallery on the wall, but also on the monitor in the parlor. Um, Martha and, Pipe and Penelope, um, why don't y'all raise your hands? They will be stationed outside, kind of moving around between the parlor and the hospitality gallery um, to answer questions or to hear about what has inspired you um, with, their, with the gifts of um, their art that they have offered to the church and during this last season. So thank you, artist, for um, host, helping us host this today, and thank you, Family of Faith, for taking a deeper look with them and celebrating these gifts among us. Right after that, in the kind of 1230-ish hour, I believe, liturgist training will be held here in the sanctuary. Lori and Judy Colby will be facilitating that. And then the music ministry search committee will be hosting um, kind of a Q, not a Q&A, uh, a session, an information session downstairs in the fellowship hall. Again, I think both of those activities are going to aim to begin around 1230, um, giving everyone a few minutes to linger with the art. So music ministry information session in the fellowship hall at 1230. Liturgist training here in the sanctuary. Um, if you can't stay today for the music information session, take a look at the back of the bulletin. There are a couple of more opportunities to meet with members of that search committee, hear what you have told us in the survey, um, and get a sense of their ongoing process of discernment for what music ministry may look like in the future at West Raleigh. Next week, all church cookout in the courtyard, uh, weather pending and permitting. Um, friends Johnny Flo and Ryan Wilder are going to be hosting that cookout. There'll also be a music ministry search committee table to kind of circle up and talk more. Um, but just mostly a time to gather, to mark and celebrate the end of the Christian formation programmatic year, to launch our way um, into Memorial Day and into the summer just to be, um, to be, to eat, and to share together. So I uh, hope you will not make other lunch plans and plan to hang around next Sunday after church. A couple of other save the dates um, are also listed on your calendar and um, also in the bulletin. Of course, uh, incoming officers, you all know that we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall um, around one o'clock following your participation in these activities and also getting some lunch. 
Any other announcements that I need to make? John Baker's got a candle. Let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of Almighty God. I'll take it. Thank you. Will all who are able in body or in spirit stand and let us join our voices in the call to worship. Praise the Lord, all the earth, the heavens shine with the glory of God, the ocean's depth reveal the mystery of the Creator. Praise the Holy One, people of the earth, people near and far, people present and people to come people for whom life is young and those wise with age. Come, people of God, and let us praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised.
Sometimes it takes keeping going to figure out where we are. And that's part of when we come to confession. We keep on naming to figure out where we are. And in our confessions, we are honest about who we are and who we want to be and the things that create the stumbling along the way. But by grace, we are bold to pray, to know who we are and to know who we are by God and God's merciful listening ears. Let us pray. God of love, you call us to love one another just as Jesus loved us. You ordain us to be one with each other, even as the Father and the Son are one. Yet we continue to eye one another with skepticism when we encounter someone new, letting difference divide us instead of unite us. We let our stereotypes form our judgments instead of building relationships. In your mercy, forgive us. Baptize us anew with the power of the Holy Spirit. Give us the curiosity to seek to know one another deeply, the courage to accept those who you accept, to love those who you love, to forgive one another as you have forgiven us, and to live and work as one body through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. It is the good news by which we live that in God's abundant mercy and Christ's gentleness in our lives, we have been forgiven and we are called to live as people redeemed and called to live as people of peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated while our youngest Christians come and join Pastor Catherine at the steps. Good morning. Hey, Campbell and Emma Kate. How are y'all? Come on up. We're going to come to the table today. Campbell asked a very good question as we were coming into worship. I was holding the Domino's box, and she was like, why are you taking Domino's to church? I can't play Domino's during the sermon, can I? What am I doing with Domino's? It's a really good question. So the earliest Christians, um, the very, very early church, Peter and Paul and Thomas and some of those disciples, Lydia, who knew Jesus, Um, even before he died and was resurrected, and then those who knew people who knew Jesus, the early church, they didn't yet have the word Christian. They didn't really even yet have the word church. So they began to call themselves these new communities of faith that were forming to follow Jesus and what Jesus taught. They called them people of the way, right? Right? The way being people who followed the way of Jesus, right? Who did what he taught and who told his story, people of the way. So that kind of tells us that there was a certain way to walk the walk, right? To follow in the way, the pathway maybe 
of Jesus. So I thought we might play, I'm going to give Campbell five and Emma Kate five. And I might take three. Now, what we're going to do with these is we're going to think about some of the, hold them up in your hands because we're going to actually build something with them. We're not going to play dominoes with the colors and the numbers, even though that's really a fun game. Um, We're going to think about some of the ways that Jesus taught his early disciples how to live that created this whole way of life, this whole pathway of life. So what are some of the ways that Jesus taught his disciples to live? Can you think of some? What do you think? When somebody um, was, did something wrong to a friend, another disciple, how, what were they supposed to do? Did they hold the grudge and carry it with them? Or did Jesus say, you've got to talk to each other about it and learn to forgive? That's right. So forgiveness is one. And we're going to try to let these stand up. You think we can do it? Forgiveness is one pathway, one stepping stone on the way. What about if somebody is hungry? Sharing food. Sorry. Yep, so who wants to use one of your stones? Okay, if somebody is thirsty, Jesus said give them something to drink. Okay, and McKay. Good. What else? Absolutely, kindness. Kindness matters. Yep, set it back up. We're going to see if we can get through this without knocking them down. Yep, nice work. These are not totally flat dominoes, just so you know. Is it going to fall backwards? Here, let's try another one. I'll take that one. See if you can get it. It was definitely the domino. Yep. Okay, what else? We've got give them something to eat, something to drink. Kindness matters. Forgive. What are some other stepping stones on this way? What if somebody is sick? Mm -hmm. Helping hands. Yep, that's another one. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Let's see if we can set them back up one more time. There you go. We're going to make one big way. All right. And Kate, while Campbell works on that, let's think of, see if we can think of two more. What do you think? What if you don't know someone's name? What if someone is new to the group, the classroom, the church, the community, and you don't yet know their name, or maybe it's even hard to pronounce? What do you think that Jesus would call his followers to do? Good work, Campbell. Okay, everybody, hold your breath. Would you think that Jesus would want them to remain a stranger? Or do you think that could become friends? That's right. And McKay, do you think you can carefully put one? Yep. Everybody hold your breath. Okay, let's do one more. You think? Okay. Okay. Is there one more we can think of? Or are we good? This will do for now, right? Thankfulness, that's a great one. That's grateful and thankful. To be grateful and thankful, that's right. Any more bubbling up? It gets easier once you begin to think of them, you start thinking of more. Any others you can think of? Sharing. Yeah. Once you get started on the, ooh, once you get started on this way, you start to learn it. And the way gets bigger and long. Okay, perfect. It's okay. We're going to leave it. So what we were going to do, <laughs> Camel, why don't you hold this one? We're going to imagine. So when Pharisees, Sadducees, the disciples, all several times throughout this story, 
in a, in a variety of different ways, people would ask, so what is the greatest thing that we can do? What's the one thing of all these things that's going to mark our way the most? And over and over again, do you, remember, do you know what Jesus said? Love. Love one another just as Jesus and God loves you. And by that love, people will know God's love. And love everybody. That's right. That love goes for every single body in the whole wide world. Love everybody. That's right. And it's that love that like starts this whole domino effect, right? So the idea was if we could have made these dominoes stand up, Campbell got us going again. That love is like the beginning. Can you, you want to push it? And it zips all the way through these acts of kindness, generosity, gratitude, sharing, feeding, thirsting, learning someone's name, clothing, visiting, all these other things that are part of walking the way of Jesus. They are started by God's breath of love, love, love. Now, imagine... We definitely could not have done that with these dominoes and this carpet. But turn around and look out the door. Imagine that we could set up this domino train all the way from the font, out the door, around the corner, and out the doors of the church. And imagine that we as the church could be tipped off by God's love and that that domino trail would go... Can you imagine it going out to the whole world? We wouldn't even have enough dominoes. But look in the sanctuary. We don't have enough dominoes, but what we do have enough of? People. That's right. What if the people are the dominoes? Then what begins to happen if we look out at all these people? Then can you imagine... Imagine where all these people are going this week. Raise your hand if you're going to school, teaching or student. Okay, raise your hand if you're not going to school because the semester's over, but you usually go to school. <laughs> uh -huh. Raise your hand if you're going to work. Raise your hand if you're going to some kind of neighborhood or committee meeting. Raise your hand if you're going to do something with neighbors. Raise your hand if you're going to do something with church people. Raise your hand if you're going to do something with people not a members of this congregation. Imagine if all those hands were dominoes and one of these acts of being part of the way was part of their interaction with people. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? But here's the thing. That's what God imagines for us. That we're not just Christians here but that that love gets spread throughout like dominoes. And that would turn us into a pretty amazing world, wouldn't it? Yep. All right, we're going to leave the dominoes up here to remember the domino effect. But you know what? We should get together and play dominoes at some point in the future. All right, let's go to the font. All right. And we're just going to gather around the water, a little circle, and put our fingers in the water. Can you reach? All right, and let's pray. I'll say a line, and then I'll let y'all say a line, and you can play with the water. Gracious God. Okay, y'all have to repeat after me. Is that okay? Okay, gracious God, we thank you for loving us and for loving the whole world. And for reminding us over and over again that we're part of the domino effect. Spreading your love in, in the world. Amen. All right. Can you mark your forehead with a sign? You are loved and beloved. Now you get to go be dominoes in the world. All right. <laughs> With Miss Birdie Beaker. <laughs> they might have had donuts this morning, I'm not sure.
Deep breath and let us pray. Gracious God, your word is eternal. Through the generations, this word has come to your people, and we have sought to know and to hear your voice. On this day, clear the distractions from our mind, open our ears, and let us hear what you have to say to your church this day. In Christ we pray, amen. Our first reading comes from John's Gospel. Listen for God's word. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you a little longer. You will look for me, and I said, as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Acts of the Apostle, chapter 11, the first 18 verses. Here again what the Spirit has to say to the church. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? And then Peter began to explain it to them step by step. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, saying, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again to heaven. And at that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. And the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that God gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they had heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These are tender, tough, and ultimately transformative moments in the life of the early church. The first one in John that Lori led happens before Jesus' death and resurrection. 
than this one that I read recorded by Luke in the Acts of the Apostles comes after Jesus ascends into heaven. Taken together, they give us a glimpse of the fullness of Jesus' commandment to love one another. Just as I have loved you, Jesus said, you also should love one another. By this, by this love, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. These are lovely words. And they're words that can seem at once both lofty goals and also simple words to live by until you look a little bit deeper at the context. In John's gospel, Jesus says these words to the disciples, gives them this commandment again at the Last Supper, just moments after Judas left the table to betray him. Jesus and the disciples had been gathered around the table for hours at this point. He had washed their feet, telling them, So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you also ought to wash one another's feet. He explained that they were coming to the moment of his trial. Peter made his objections, which will only lead to his own denial of Jesus later that night. And then towards the end of the meal, when Judas makes his last moves, clutching the communal purse, took bread and cup and pushed back from the table. John ends that scene telling readers, and it was night. It was a scene change. It was a mic drop. It was a moment, and everything changed. And no one, of, no one would have begrudged Jesus this moment. No one would have begrudged him a flash of anger or a cry of grief Everyone would have understood if Jesus had used Judas as an example. But that's not what Jesus did. This was not tough love. This was love in the toughest of circumstances. Jesus turns from theology to intimacy. He turns from lofty words to vulnerability among friends. He says to the disciples gathered Little children, I'm with you only a little bit longer. You will look for me, but just as I have said to your, your siblings in the faith, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come, but I give you a new commandment, that you may love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. For it is by this that everyone will know who and whose you are. At this last supper, Jesus had tended to the deepest of human needs. He had washed their feet. He had made sure that everyone had enough to eat. He had shared his fears with his friends. He had listened deeply as they shared their fears with him. He had reassured them that even though he would soon leave them, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, as it's called in John, would remain abiding, hovering, always present with them. For three years, they had lived and worked together and built among themselves a new community. They had learned to depend on one another trusting Jesus to provide what they needed, learning to share what they had so that everyone would have enough. They had everything they needed to survive, what they would not be able to avoid. If they continued living in this way, this pathway of love, Jesus assured them, everyone will know that you are my disciples. This will be the mark of the new community. Something so simple has always proved so hard for the church to live out. The first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles offers story after story of where this commandment to be a community that is shaped by love gets lost or contested as the early church tries to translate it into practice. And the story of Peter and Cornelius is a really good example. 
So what we are reading in chapter 11, what I read a few minutes ago in chapter 11, is actually the church's reaction to what happened in chapter 10. Luke tells the story of an Italian centurion named Cornelius. Luke describes him as a God-fearing man who is known for personal piety and generosity. One afternoon, he has a vision that leads him to send his messengers to Joppa to find Peter. The next day, after the messengers had been dispatched to Joppa, Peter went into a trance while praying. He had a great vision of a white sheep that cheeked, that was held by four corners, and it was lowered all the way to the ground. And on that sheet were animals of all kinds, most notably animals that Peter had never eaten because amongst his community of faith, they were considered unclean. The message was pure, was clear, and it came to Peter twice, saying the second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. I've wondered if somewhere in the recesses of Peter's mind, he remembers an earlier conversation that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, They were questioning Jesus on what makes an individual and a community holy. When questioned, he called the crowds to him so that everyone could hear. Listen and understand, Jesus said. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Because what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that's the home of our intentions. Peter awakens from this vision and is still pondering what it means when Cornelius' messengers knock on the door. Again, the Spirit intervenes, telling Peter not to hesitate, but to go and to meet them and to listen to them. So Peter follows these holy nudges like dominoes, falling one after the other, a cascading understanding that brings these two believers together about to be formed into a new community. So Peter arrives at Cornelius' home where he is received with gracious hospitality. And Peter begins to witness. He tells the story of what he saw, of what he heard, of what he experienced in Jesus. And again, the Spirit did what the Spirit does. And they believed and were baptized. And the believing community grew. Again, here, I think it's one of those places where it is helpful to understand what did happen against what did not happen. Peter accepted Cornelius' invitation to stay in his home. He ate at Cornelius' table, accepting what was offered. He didn't require Cornelius and his household to adhere to the same food codes that had shaped Peter's own life and faith. He remained at Cornelius' house for several days, hearing the stories of his family of faith, teaching from his own experience of Jesus and then baptizing in his name. He did not require the believers to be baptized or to be circumcised before baptism. He did not require them to be examined by the elders in Jerusalem. He did not try to change Cornelius and his family. Instead, he told them everything he knew about the liberating love of God that had been made known to him in the flesh and in the blood of Jesus. And with that, With that sharing of story, around that sharing of God's story, the Spirit changed them all. However, when word of this spread and reached the church in Jerusalem, the mother or home church, if you will, they were underwhelmed. They were hesitant. They were skeptical. Can you, church, imagine why? How could it be, they said, that Peter would stay in the house of a Gentile, accept his hospitality, 
and eat his food without any education or training around these codes and laws that have shaped families of faith for generations. And how could Peter baptize this entire household without requiring that they be circumcised first? For without adherence to these ancient and time-tested practices, could those people become a part of our community? What would set them apart as God's people? What would set them apart? Read also what would make them part of us. So I've been stewing over these words this week, and I can't decide if this is good news or bad news. I think it's both. Because here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still making the same mistakes. The good news is that it's 2,000 years later, and we're still here. The bad news is that we keep making the same mistakes. History is littered with examples But most recently, you can hear the language of church membership and growth. Starting in the 1980s, when mainline congregations across the country began to measure and really see and feel often in their budgets decline in membership, a whole Christian cottage industry developed around church growth. The academy began many longitudinal surveys and studies began to research this phenomenon of decline. And congregations went to work with all sorts of programs that promised to put people back in the pews. We wanted them to join us here, to learn the time-tested ways of being church that have nourished and nurtured us for generations. Honestly, I trace most of this inclination to grief. For many of us still here in the church, maybe even in the congregation that had nourished and nurtured us. This is the church of our parents and our grandparents. The music and the liturgy is written on our hearts, and we can't imagine being Christian without it. We have grown up working within the committee structure of the Presbyterian Church. We believe that the Spirit works among people who share responsibility and that sin has less fertile ground in a system of transparency and accountability. And all of this wants us, all of this leads us to want them to come here so that they can be nourished and nurtured in the same way that our families have been loved. And I get it. My family is rooted in this tradition, worship, liturgy, and way of being community. And yet, when I go back to the growth in the early church, as told throughout these stories in Acts, it's never about institutional growth and replication. Notice that God is already working in Cornelius and his household. He's known for his constant prayer and his generosity. And when the Spirit brings he and Peter together, they are both, they are all transformed. Cornelius and his household hear the full liberating story of God's love, and Peter realizes that some of the practices that once marked him as a man of faith are no longer necessary, no longer healthy for this growing body, no longer helpful for his faith. Instead, Peter's understanding of this new community expands, and they are all transformed into a new culturally diverse, messy, complicated, but very lively family of faith. And if you're unsure about what I mean by that, Paul's letters to the Corinthians are a great place to explore culturally diverse, messy, complicated, and lively communities of faith. West Raleigh, Easter people, here we are again entering a season of transition and of change. We have two search committees that are active. 
One is nearing the end of the listening and discernment phase and preparing to write the position description for music ministry in this next season for West Raleigh. The other search committee is seeking candidates and preparing for the interview process for the new pastor for community formation. And it would be easy for us to see these new positions and the people who will come to fill them as coming to help us grow the church. But church, we do so at our own peril, for we cannot be about growing ourselves. We have to be about the domino effect, about sharing the good news of the gospel, the liberating love of God that has been made known to us in Jesus. We have to be about dreams and prayers and acts of kindness and following in this way outward. We have to be a people that trust in the spirit that transformed Peter and Cornelius, making them into brothers and making their distinct congregations into one new expanded community. Jerome, you're very welcome. Jerome, is that right? What was your name again? I'm sorry. Ramon, we're glad and grateful that you're here today. We truly, truly are. Um, Amen. I look forward to talking to you more after church. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah. Church of Jesus Christ, God is with us, continuing to make strangers into friends and to bring us together in ways that we can only dream of 
and yet are also made very real in the form of love that binds us to one another. What will this look like? I don't know. Any more than I know what will happen in worship and whose names and stories will become known and made real to us. But what I do know is that being church is more than a dream. It's a way. It's a way of walking into a sacred and a holy space, of welcoming one another with all of who we are, our grief, our hopes, and our fears. And it is the fullness of God's dream for us. May it be so in here. May it be so everywhere we go. And all God's people say, Alleluia. And amen. Using the ancient words of the church universal, let us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. There are many prayers that we continue as a church community to hold together. Some of those printed in your bulletin are now on the screen. We are aware of many who are recovering from COVID and continue to hold them in prayers as we do the peoples in the conflict in Ukraine and those who are battling the fires in the Southwest. And especially this weekend, we're mindful of yet more gun violence in other parts of our country. And even in these sorrows, we have these wonderful joys, the beautiful flowers given for the remembrance of the Thornberry's moms, for the newly settled Afghan family that this congregation has supported, and especially for Olivia Joy Davis, who has joined our family. And we are thankful for the goodness that prevails over that which is difficult. Let us pray. For the joy of your presence, changing and renewing us each day, we offer you our praise, O God. For the blessing you bring us, the outpouring of your love each day, we offer you our praise. For peace beyond understanding, blessed assurance each day, we we give you our praise. For your word that endures, teaches, and challenges generation after generation, we offer you our praise. Daily we hear and we know the burdens of this world ache when fear gets the upper hand, despair and apathy at helplessness. Cure the warring madness that shatters your intended goodness. We know your heart and what can be so. We continue to pray for wisdom and courage to care and to act and to remember. Wrap your spirit around families skirted away from loved ones this week those who have been isolated, those whose health is failing, those caught in unexpected circumstances, those in the valley of the shadows. Be manifest in the works and vision of advocates and caregivers. Redeeming God, we are so thankful for the children and youth of this congregation, for all they bring and who they are and who they are becoming with their creativity and eagerness to engage life. In this world of too much abuse of power, keep us mindful of children young and now grown who have experienced and witnessed abuse and violence. May we offer children and youth kindness, compassion, and safety, and be models of respect, equity, and inclusion. May peace radiate through our relationships to our communities and beyond. We pray for the helping professionals working with victims and survivors, for those seeking home and those in the paths of storms, for first responders and shelter workers, for educators and healthcare providers, for workers in the justice system, for faith leaders and volunteers, that all will be nurtured in their communities and that they will be kept well and safe. We pray that they will know your good pleasure and our gratitude for their essential efforts as witness and as people who care, helping to heal our broken world. We weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, knowing that the sorrows and joys of life create the texture by which we know and are known. Hear our grateful prayers for those in our lives who walk with us, stand with us, cheer for us, hold us accountable, and encourage us all along the way. In silence, we see their faces and name their names before you. Receive our personal prayers this day. The prayers that may be daily on our lips, the prayers that we are hesitant to name, the prayers too deep for sighs yet known by your Holy Spirit, (laughs) receive into your grace our silent prayers for ourselves 
and for others. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Pour the power of Holy Spirit upon us to live out that command in every way we can so that we may be your people in our communities, caring about our neighbors known and unknown, being holy antidote to what is unkind and fearful. Bind us into the heart and the church of Jesus as we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The abundance of tithes and offerings reaches not only the domino effect down this hall, but certainly into that imagination of all the communities and all of the world. And we continue to be bound together by that and continue to reach into the abundance of that. One of the places that this abundance is known and has been known for a long, long time is through this congregation's commitment to Family Promise. And Bob Grant is going to come and tell us a little bit more about Family Promise. Morning. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. How do we live out and express our love? As we recited in the prayer of confession, God of love, you call on us to love one another. You ordained us to be one with each other. Yet we continue to eye one another with skepticism. When we encounter someone new, letting differences divide us instead of unite us. We let our stereotypes form our judgments instead of building relationships. Give us the curiosity to seek to know one another deeply and to live and work as one body. When we spend time working with and serving others, we truly get to know them. We have the opportunity to learn from and support others in need and critically to address our housing crisis in the triangle. You may ask yourself, What can I do? Family promise is one of those ways. As some of you learned during the Lenten series on affordable housing, the continuum of care is a community plan to organize and deliver housing and services to meet the specific needs of people who are homeless as they move to stable housing and maximum self-sufficiency. There are different programs in place to address housing needs, emergency shelter, transitional housing, and rapid rehousing. Family Promise is a program that provides emergency shelter. What can I do? This is it. At WRPC, we have supported Family Promise since 2001. Families enrolled in Family Promise are provided with emergency shelter and meals for a week at a time at different places of worship. For up to three months, families move between places of worship in Wake County. Our church is a host, and the families needing emergency shelter 
are our guests. For the last two years, due to COVID, the emergency shelter program hasn't been in place at churches. Instead, families have been staying at the transitional housing apartments that were normally set up as the next step for shelter after families left emergency shelter. While staying at the transitional housing apartment on Method Road, churches like ours provide financial assistance during our scheduled host week and provide catered meals and groceries to families who were staying in those apartments. Due to the recent rise in COVID cases, our upcoming host week, the week of June 26, will again be off-site at the transitional apartments. Instead of physical support that we typically provide here, we'll continue to provide financial support that helps to provide catered meals and groceries to families. You can make a donation by writing WRPC and putting Family Promise in the memo line. The same can be done virtually through Realm. We anticipate that our last host week of 2022, the week of September the 4th, we will return to actually host here at our church, September the 4th. Your support for this program directly impacts those who need housing. What can I do? This is it. If the issue of stable, affordable housing for all is one that you believe in, Family Promise immediately enables you to have an impact. You can prepare meals, you can eat with a guest, you can spend time with families in the evening, you can play with kids and help with homework, you can donate groceries, you can drive the, the van in the morning or in the evening, or you can stay overnight with guests. You can also help break down rooms and set up rooms. Before September 4th, our host week, which we actually hope to host here in the building, I'll again reach out for your support. For now, just put September 4th on your calendar and write a check to help support those who will be in transitional housing for our host week later in June. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon, and I'd love to talk to you more about that after church. Thanks.
Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, receive from us our commitments and our intentions, all of the resources that we give, that your love would be made known, not only in this place, but throughout our communities and this wide, wide world. We give you thanks for your grace that sustains us in all the ways that we get to be your faithful people. It is in your holiness we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor and serve all people rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God, the Creator, and the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with you all, with everyone who is dear to you, and with those who are known and dear only to God. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And all God's people say, Alleluia and Amen. Amen.